You are listening to an After Dinner Conversation magazine podcast. After Dinner Conversation believes humanity is improved by ethics and morals grounded in philosophical truth, and that truth is discovered through intentional reflection and respectful debate. In order to facilitate this process, we have created a growing series of print books, a monthly short story magazine, and two different podcasts. This podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Audiobooks, provides audiobook recordings of stories that have appeared in our magazine. And our companion podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Discussions, is where we discuss the ethics of the choices made in the stories as a way to model the kinds of discussions we hope you're having about these readings with friends, family, or students. We would love it if you went over to check it out. I'm Roberta, your narrator and one of the acquisition editors at After Dinner Conversation Publishing. Thank you for spending your time listening to our podcast and for reading the magazine. Thank you for supporting us through your magazine subscriptions and through patreon.com slash after dinner conversation. And of course, if you enjoy this audiobook reading, please subscribe to our podcast, share it on social media, and suggest it to friends. Today's story is Now the Leaves Are Falling Fast, written by Deb Rogers, and published in our April 2021 magazine. Now the Leaves Are Falling Fast, by Deb Rogers. I watched my wife leave our neighbor's house, her empty hands shoved deep in the pockets of her red anorak. She came inside through our carport. I met her in our kitchen. Beverly was really happy for the soup, she said. Honestly, it was a little sad. No one else has brought food, and he's going to hospice tomorrow. It's really bad, and no one, not a single person, has reached out to her. Just what I thought. I have been watching my neighbor's house from my living room chair on and off for the last two years now. William and Beverly have a simple 3-2 ranch that is the mirror image of ours, except William let his yard go to pot, and I've kept mine up, even with my back shot to hell the way it is. I owe it to my family to take care of things. I owe it to my neighborhood, but not William. Well, what can you expect from a guy who let his daughter do prison time for selling drugs when he was the guy running the scheme? If you're a man who is weak enough to do that, you don't want to show your face outside to trim the hedges and you also aren't going to have many friends to lean on during your last days alive. My wife confirmed what I already knew. I was pretty sure William was down to his last week or so because the nurses had started to visit twice a day. Everything will happen fast now. Death and disaster are like ambush predators. They wait, and then before you know it, their work is done. My wife washed her hands. I think Beverly truly was very moved by the gesture, she said. My wife tidied the kitchen as she spoke, weaving like a pollinating bee. She has been holed up there with him for how long now since Tammy's arrest and whatever deal he took. I don't feel sorry for Beverly because she made her choices, but then again, I kind of do because she stuck with him. I wonder if she'll sell the house. She should. I told you they have no friends, no life. They never leave the house, not for church or nothing anymore. If I were her, I'd sell everything and move closer to the prison. At least visit Tamara now and then. At least that. My wife kicked the gas up to heat the big pot of simmering soup. We always have a nice supper before I go to work. Beverly didn't say anything about Tamara. She also didn't ask me about Kate at any length. She said, I hope Kate's doing well, which isn't a question, to which I wanted to say she is, but no thanks to your family. But I didn't. Anyway, you did good, honey. There's a nip in the air. Anyone would be happy for a bowl of soup tonight. And tomorrow he leaves. You did good. I went ahead and called in sick for the night, just to be sure I was home in time to see William vacated from his house, just to be sure I was rested. The information was accurate. The very next morning, just as I was sitting down with my coffee, a transport ambulance slinked into their driveway and the guys walked slowly into the house. I watched it carefully. It took them so long that at one point I thought they might have been working on an emergency. But eventually they proved me wrong, lumbering out with William on a gurney. He was off my street forever. I poured a second cup of coffee. 
I got dressed, putting on my yard clothes. I almost put on my trusty old work boots, but I grabbed the sneakers instead. Then I went back to my chair. I thought I might have to stand watch until after lunch. But Beverly left soon enough in her gold Chrysler, just as I predicted. I knew she would follow him to hospice as soon as possible. Beverly was going to stick by his side until the very end. It's go time, I roared. Try to stay calm. Do you have your phone? My wife was, as ever, the finest arrow, strong, flexible, determined. I thumped my chest pocket. I don't know if any of my other neighbors watch our street like I do. I don't think so. They're all gone most workdays. But if anyone caught sight of me, what they would have seen was my rake, my thick gloves crammed in my back pocket, and my plaid shirt collar poking above my work jacket. My wife designed my costume. She called it the silhouette. I walked straight through my neighbor's carport into his backyard and quickly raked a few scoops of leaves into a black trash bag. Pin oak, damp and ripe with neglect. Years ago, we sat under that tree many a night, William and I, beer in hand. That's when the subdivision was new, and our young daughters were fast friends. Both the same age, both only children, both smart kids in a good school district with nothing but sunlight and success ahead. But our Saturday night barbecue stopped years later when William tried to pull me into a scheme he and his brothers cooked up with the dentists. I wanted no part of him after that. I stayed away, but I didn't pull back far enough. I truly regret letting my daughter remain friends with Tamara. The girls were teenagers, almost ready to look for colleges by that point, and I had no idea how fast their futures could be reduced to ash. But that's no excuse. I let my daughter down. I propped my rake against the house and fished a key out of my pocket. For almost a decade, I kept that key on my fridge from back when we were neighbors who looked out for each other. Even though I had the key, I half expected to need to jimmy the door. Surely William would have changed his lock at some point. But no, the key slid in the lock like a hot knife through butter. I'm sure my wife could see me there in the carport, the silhouette of me, so she knew I was in. There was cash in that house, and I was going to find it. I knew William. He saved bolts in baby food jars and didn't hire yard guys. I just knew he still had some of that money. He wasn't spending it that I could see. I bet he squirreled it away and intended to be buried with it, like a mad king. Searching their house was nerve-wracking, but it shouldn't have been. I was sure Beverly went straight to the hospice. But even if she came home, my wife was supposed to text me and run out to distract her. If for some reason I didn't get out of the house in time, I was going to fake a bathroom emergency that occurred while I was charitably raking their leaves and try to get away with that. That was the plan, to hide behind an act of kindness. And it was solid. Their house was musty and dark. I went room to room, begging myself to stay deliberate. I had a hard time, though. I wanted to concentrate my efforts in his bedroom, because they say people are predictable animals who want their valuables close to them when they sleep. But the room stank like medicine and finality. I couldn't breathe while shining a flashlight under his bed, and the bathroom felt even clammier. I pressed on. I rifled and dug like a broken-hearted beagle. But I found nothing. I thought I had it twice in Tamara's old room, still set up as though she would be coming home for dinner. But the beanbag chair held only pellets, and the shoe boxes in her closet held only shoes. The third bedroom was full of sewing machine junk, bookshelves, and a desk. Nothing. The kitchen was a wreck of old whipped topping containers and unwashed cereal bowls. Nothing of value except a roll of forever stamps. Not even when I carefully poked deep into the freezer and under the sink past the pine cleaner that clearly wasn't used often. I looked for a drop ceiling, an odd built-in, a hassock that might be hollow. Coming up dry, I began to worry it was in the attic, and I wasn't prepared to go there today. I hadn't seen any jewelry in Beverly's room, so that made me worry that they had a safe or a bank box somewhere. Or maybe he converted his money into gold and buried it. If I had miscalculated, I would be leaving empty-handed, reams of anticipation shot to hell. I stood in the front room for a second, looking through the window at my own house, at my wife standing sentry by the chair. 
I didn't want to let her down. I thought about how much I wanted to find something of value so that we could help our Kate buy a car. Her addiction and rehab stays had me set back again and again, and now she's finally working. She could use a little boost. Her whole life will always be a game of catch-up from behind because of William. William owed Kate. William owed me. What exactly he owed me kept me up at night. I couldn't get Kate back to who she was before, much less who she would have become. I couldn't take William's daughter away from him. He already did that to himself. I was left by default with taking what he valued, though now that he was dying, I doubted he would even care about the loss of his treasure chest. Not that I could find it. It was peculiar to be in this carnival version of my house, this flipped mirror. It wasn't a home, but some things were the same. The construction, the shadows cast by the hallways, and even the placement of the furniture. They even had a family portrait hanging on the same exact spot of the wall by the front door where we had our own family portrait, which had been taken at an Oktoberfest fair when Kate was little, her tiny arms flung around a massive pumpkin. I thought about Tamara, who was only seven or eight in this photo, and about the man William had been back then. He looked proud and strong. He had been my friend. Had he been a good father in those days, well before greed and destruction eroded the sugar of him? Or had I simply missed the early clues that should have shooed me away from this ruinous family? I returned to Tamara's room. If he had money, it would have been in there. William let his own daughter take the fall once, so odds told me he would repeat the pattern. This round, I took more time to look through each and every shoebox instead of just sampling boxes here and there. Bingo. That did the trick. Eight shoeboxes, heavy with cash. It might not have been all of William's valuables, but it was a lot, and it was enough. Of course, he would hide the last dregs of his crimes amidst his daughter's things. I was going to ask my wife what she thought about maybe using some of the money to help Tamara get a few hours with a new lawyer. I was back out, my leaf bags full of dark money I would make clean by helping Kate. I grabbed my rake and dragged it across William's front yard a few times, collecting the very ugly sycamore leaves that had been spoiling my view for too long already. I could feel my wife watching me, so I nodded and smiled as I worked. I knew without looking that she had been a good sentry and that she was still patiently watching over me. When I was done, I carried my heavy harvest across the street. I knew in my bones that by the time I cleared the carport, she would have already gone to the kitchen to warm the pot of leftover soup for our celebratory lunch. I would regale her with details for my hunt. She would describe my silhouette and any traffic or passers-by observed from her perch. In the past, we didn't pay close enough attention to what happened on this street. But that was behind us. We would never make that mistake again. Now for the discussion questions. Are the narrator and his wife justified in taking the shoeboxes of money from their neighbors? What factors weigh into your opinion? Number two, is the narrator correct? Could he have done more to keep two teenage girls that were next door neighbors from becoming friends? Could he have steered his daughter away from being friends with a negative influence? Number three, does the fact that the narrator and his wife act altruistically toward the neighbor affect your opinion of them? Does this deception of bringing over soup or raking the leaves make their actions of theft worse? Number four, does the fact that the stolen money will be used for the narrator's daughter, Kate, affect your opinion of his actions? Does doing good from bad make a difference? Does it matter if William was saving that money to give to his daughter, Tamara, when she got out of prison? And number five, how do you know the narrator is telling you the absolute truth of what happened leading up to the arrests? What do you think the real truth of the story of the drugs and arrests are? 
You've been listening to Now the Leaves Are Falling Fast, written by Deb Rogers and published in our April 2021 magazine. Next week, we'll be reading Reach by Mark Braidwood. If you enjoyed this story, head over to our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, and listen to our discussions of this and other short stories from our magazine. We will include a link in the description. And of course, you can always continue the discussion on our webpage, in the comment section, or on our Facebook page. Thank you for joining us. Until next time.